if uh, anyone in the room has any questions for Pat and Roy, we'd love to hear them. Nothing is too silly, although I, I could see that Roy's uh, last comment about trial preparation might have scared some of the aspiring attorneys in the room a little bit. Um, but are there any questions for our two esteemed guests? Oh, fantastic. This is an experiment, so Dan, let me know if you can't hear us. As two people who have probably seen and mentored dozens if not hundreds of young lawyers, what would you say is the most important aspect you look for in people who are just coming up and just starting their legal career that you look for as senior lawyers? That's a good question. And what you look for is, is the lawyer really ready? Has the young lawyer really gotten his or her arms around the case? Are they able to deal in a conversational way with you about the significant issues that the case presents to you, you the partner? Uh, th that's what you really look for. And there are ways that associates show that. They show it by talking about the case law. They show it by talking about what the, who the judges were. Because a question partner will inevitably have when you come in with a case, who wrote the opinion? The appellate division first department is a great court, wonderful judges. But knowing who the justice is who wrote that opinion is very significant to how you judge whether that status, that stature on that issue is something you want to live with or argue against. So it's, how, how well is the associate prepared? That's the basic question. I think for me, I mean, as a, I was in a prosecutor's office, I certainly had a lot of uh, supervisory responsibility, which was pretty terrifying for a lot of young lawyers who were, you know, didn't have a lot of experience. But what I look for is maturity, preparation, then maturity, uh, good judgment, and, uh, and uh, a willingness to really dig in and do whatever needs to be done and not take the, you know, the shortcuts and um, not BS me. That's uh, important. Any other questions? Judge? Yeah, let me I'll start, if it's okay, with an observation, <coughs> followed by a question. And I'm very curious to know <coughs> what your answer is, given that the combined experience here is significant. Um, the observation is that <coughs> Roy Reardon and Pat Hines are here because not only are they the best, but because we value and honor them and respect them and have affection for them. In contrast to big time lawyers who more frequently go by the name killer lawyers and wind up on the front page of magazine, <coughs> magazines as killer lawyers who may attract clients or maybe not, I'll just make one little observation on that. When I had seen a killer, so-called killer lawyer in my years on the bench, my reaction was, be very careful. Don't let your dislike of this person affect your ruling. I have to tell myself over and over and over again. Here we have something on the other side of the fence. And um, experience shows that during the years on the bench, the lawyers were very well behaved. They're in their best behavior. I've seen more recently, and I want to know whether you share this perception or whether my perception is either wrong or um, uh, unusual, that the notion of lawyers being killers to my mind, may have been increasing over the years in contrast to when you started. And Pat, you described how you and Peter Fleming, you could make a joke with them, you go out to dinner. It's like tennis players really duking it out, but at the end of the day, being friends and having a drink. Has that, do those, have those relationships changed over the years? I would like to believe that it's the same. But I'm just wondering from your side of the bench, whether you have seen a difference from what had been hard-fought congeniality, conviviality toward what looks like, at least on the outside, to be killer lawyers who act disrespectfully toward one another. And I, I think that's a very important question because the folks out here are entering the profession and may be interested in your observations on that. 
Wonderful question, yeah. Judge. <clears throat> in a nutshell, let me say this, that I, I think one thing I believe in, and, and I wrote this uh, to the New York Law Journal one time when a major firm literally went out of business. I didn't have the vaguest idea why they did it. But there is a lot of talk, a lot of sentiment out there today about the pursuit of the dollar. One of the things that is sort of slipping off the edge of the dish is that we are a profession. It's, it's unique. We, we must be special. There should not be this kind of slippage that J Judge Rosenblatt is talking about. And I honestly see a, a very limited amount of that in the profession. And what I, what I said in this article was, <clears throat> I believe that partners are no less bound together than brothers and sisters. When I fail, they carry me. When I succeed, my success is theirs because it has been attained in the firm in which I have enjoyed their presence. That's got to be the way we look at relationships within law firms. It, it's got to be the way we look at the behavior of lawyers. There's a lot of flamboyance out there today, and you've probably seen it. And being nasty in the courthouse can get you publicity, but it can also create a very bad aura for your future ability to persuade judges. So I, I, I think it's something that I don't see that much of, Judge, and I hope I see less. I think that for me, <clears throat> in coming through, and I was trying cases, I think that there were some lawyers, not many, um, who thought that they, if they got under your skin, it would be a benefit to them, you know, they'd unnerve you, they'd, you know, be nasty, they'd pass comments, I was a woman, I won't bore you with some of the comments. Um, I, I chose to ignore it and, um, and kind of laugh at them. Uh, because it wasn't going to, I wasn't going to let it get to me. And um, so you have to, there are lots of experiences that you can have with partners and colleagues that can get testy and this and that. You, you can't let it get to you um, because they're doing it sometimes. And certainly I have one lawyer in mind in a, in a long trial that I had, uh, thought that this way he could get me off balance. Uh, the other thing, Judge, is publicity. Um, I think that there are far too many lawyers um, in cases that want to be on the 6 o'clock news and that this is how they think they're going to get the next client. Um, I remember being in a criminal case when I was in private practice and it was a, a, a case of a politician. I had a, a minor person uh, who was going to be a witness. And when the case was over, and I knew all of these people, all of these defense lawyers for years, and they all wanted to walk out the front door of the courthouse and get the photographs taken and whatever, whatever, and with, with their clients. And I took my client and I said, we're going to go out the back door. And I said to the marshal, because it was being tried in Connecticut, um, because they didn't want to it was a southern district case, but they wanted to try it out of New York. And uh, a lawyer called me the next day and said, what, what are you, crazy? We were all on the 7 o'clock news. I said, do you think I want my client on the 7 o'clock? Do you think I want his teenage kids to see their father on the 7 o'clock news? So I think that one of the things that you have to always keep in mind is the client comes first. You don't come first. And, you know, I have always been a little afraid of the press. I, my preference is to keep a very low profile and very much under the radar. Um, and I, that's how I've always operated. 
and it's worked for me. But you have to be very careful about not being bit by that, uh, I got my name in the paper, and um, you know, I was, did you see my picture, and uh, did you see that I was on television? Because you are representing a client. That may not be in your client's best interest. So I see that playing to the press still goes on a little too much. We have uh, time for one more question. Okay. Uh, first, uh, thank you for sharing experience for, to us. And my question is, uh, as you started with your legal career, have you made any mistake? And maybe the partner we all got unhappy with that, how you passed the, that mistake? I, I missed, David, the, the last part of it. I didn't quite hear it. My question is that um, when you started with your legal career, have you ever made some mistake? And maybe sometimes the partner or your supervisor will be unhappy with that mistake, how you get past of that situation? Well, <clears throat> of course, these two have never made any mistakes. But. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you a, a story. It's really law school. I was on Law Review. I was the only woman on Law Review. <clears throat> and there was a, an editor. From, Fordham has a night school. It was an editor uh, from the night school uh, on Law Review. And I was, he was assigned to me to edit what I was writing. And he was in the Navy, and he didn't think women should be in law school, and I couldn't do anything right. I just, you know, whatever I wrote, whatever I revised, it was just never going. And finally, the other guys on the Law Review went to him and said, you got to stop that, you know? Um, you're going to run into it. Uh, People are under a lot of pressure. Sometimes it's just their personality. Sometimes they have problems at home or whatever. Um, and you just have to try to get above it. But you also have to try to see if there's some merit in it. Because some of the toughest you know, people around are brilliant, and they can be very tough on the people under them. But you have to be open to learn. Um, you don't have to take abuse. That, that you shouldn't have to do. But you know, it's. Uh, it, it's tough. You get, you get toughened up pretty quickly. <laughs> I, I think I understood the question to be basically, <clears throat> did I make mistakes? Okay, so I didn't hear that. Okay. The, well, yes. The answer is <laughs> all the time. Yes. The answer is when you're trying a case and you're number one, in the first chair. You know how many decisions you make every day. Sometimes, a hundred sometimes more, but your thought process is subject to mistakes too. And I know I've made mistakes. And the mistakes, you try and limit them, you try and limit the potential severity of taking positions that will embarrass you and hurt your client. So I'm sure I've made big ones. I don't know what they all are, and I don't remember them as I sit here, but I, I will confess to making mistakes because the, the profession I chose was to be put in a position to make judgments many, many times every single day <coughs> of your professional life. And you're gonna make mistakes because you're human. Try and limit them. Now, I mean, you will make mistakes, and, and we have all made mistakes. I mean, you put a witness on the stand and they turn turns 180 degrees, you want to kill yourself. Um, you know, or you know, start saying things that you never heard before. Um, so that is, is also learning to, to deal with it and, uh, you know, or that you missed a case. That was always my fear. If I didn't get the, the if I didn't get the case that I should get, and I, I'll tell you one quick story, I was um, in a mid-air collision case uh, for the government. I was trying this mid-air collision, still the toughest trial I ever did, and the Department of Justice had an aviation unit. And they wanted to come up and try this case. They had pilots and whatever. There was a whole aviation bar, and here I am. I look 18, you know, and I'm you know going to try a mid-air collision. The air traffic controllers who I was representing didn't even want me. They wanted the guys from Washington, right? So I got into that case, and I just 
they cited a case, and I said, I don't think that's right. And I went back, and I found the case. It wasn't right, which is the example of you're going to get caught. And then I found a case that was really on all fours because I was trying to change the venue out of the Southern District of New York. And I kept reading it there. I must be mistaken. This is really right on all fours. How could they not get this? And I wasn't mistaken. You know, they just ignored it. But, you know, you have to know that at some point you're going to miss something. You're going to miss it. And you just have to forgive yourself and go on. Learn from it. That's all. It's a, it's a great thought. It's also for what harmless error is always yes. to be thanked. <laughs> Pat and Roy, thank you so much for taking your time to be here You're tonight. Welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, if you could all please give her a round of applause for our city senior guest. I'd like to thank uh, Simpson Thatcher again for helping co-host this event, the City Bar, and um, all of you for coming. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at a future event. And for me to not tripping over the mic. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.